subject about the music industry that I honestly don't think has been discussed much, but I think it's important because eventually there will come a point where the legacy bands that, for all intents and purposes, are keeping things going through their revenue generation as a result of being live performers will eventually retire and the up-and-comers will be the ones having to lead the charge, ensuring there still is a live scene for everybody. Bottom line is that bands just starting out need to be successful in any way so fans can enjoy them. So given that, even on a small scale, I've realized somebody like me plays a role in it too as a quote, micro-influencer, as much as I despise a title like that. And I thought what I have to say could be very valuable, because all things considered, in only a very short time as a YouTuber involved with heavy metal, I have gotten to do some insanely cool stuff, man. Stuff I never imagined I'd be able to do. But equally, so too have I learned things. I have learned a tremendous, tremendous amount, specifically, and here's what the heart of this video is about, the relationship that exists between the bands, their publicists, and the influencer, or more granularly speaking, in my case, micro-influencer. But honestly, I just call myself a voice. And I think by passing on what I've learned, it could be very helpful in ensuring the idea of the live show stays appealing enough for people that want to spend their money on it. And obviously, in this digital day and age, that appeal is birthed online. So before I get started, and just so you know, I'm going to use a few words a lot. I'm telling you that so their frequent use doesn't come off annoyingly. But the words there are four are band, publicist, influencer, and relationship. So here goes. It occurred to me that I now have existing relationships with several publicists with bands as their clients. See? And while there exists a pretty established definition of what the relationship between the publicist and the band is, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot out there on how prong three, the influencer, fits in. So if you're somebody that might also want to have a place in the back end of it all, such as being a YouTuber that covers metal, or you're an aspiring publicist, keep watching. To begin, a note on public relations. Obviously, there's entire college degrees dedicated to it, for which I don't have. I was a communications major. So for any publicist that might be watching, you can rest assured I'm fully aware I'm not trying to voice this stuff as something you'd find in a textbook, obviously. Instead, it's purely the perspective of the, quote, influencer. From what I understand, the role of the publicist is to help the client be absolutely successful as they can be. So as a client or a band, aka the talent, one option for being more successful is yes, through hiring a publicist. Step one is arguably that the band has to decide how successful they'd like to be and what their goals are and what they're willing to do in order to ensure maximum potential for reaching that success. Do you want to regularly tour the country? Do you want to be invited to some of the big metal festivals in the US every year? Like Milwaukee Metal Fest, New England Metal and Hardcore Fest, Maryland Death Fest, Metal Injection Festival, Hell's Heroes? Or do you want spots on more diverse Fest like Rocklahoma and Blue Ridge, Hell Coachella? Do you want a slot starting out as a support act for bigger metal bands? Or would you simply be happy playing locally whenever you get the opportunity in your region? This is of course assuming you do want to play live and not simply release music and that's it. But okay, once those goals are recognized, I think it's then beneficial to honestly and truthfully consider how much of your time and spirit you're willing to dedicate to promoting yourself. This is very key in the beginning because, and some of my publicist friends friends may hate me for saying this, please forgive me, but I truly don't think hiring a publicist should be done before you've done all you can on your own. So a good question to ask yourself at that point is, does what we have on our socials look good enough to where it would impress and excite a publicist to want to work with us? Because consequently, if it doesn't, the publicist, and I'm really getting my Matt Bacon on in this one, Bacon Bits on Instagram, Dropout Media if you know him, because if it doesn't, you need to realize that you're limiting the extent to which the publicist can promote you. Now, before I go deeper into that, I need to issue a huge disclaimer about something you, the viewer, somebody without money in the game, already might have picked up on, and it's that in some cases, not all, but absolutely some, the music, of course, the music must, must, must be there. Good songs have to be there. The reason I say that's only true in some cases, though, is because, let's say you're a grind band, for example, I think it's safe to assume that most grind bands prioritize getting their face blown off by the noise and that's about it. If you're a hardcore band, a lot of times it's the aggression that fuels the passion for that style. So while your fans may not require Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, they do want you to move them and make them dance with enough two-step 
parts and breakdowns. But if you're more of a traditional heavy metal band, or perhaps even primarily thrash or stoner, if you want people to love you, you now have to start thinking about moving other things besides just their heads or their bodies. Your music's gonna have to fill gaps emotionally and fill voids or help heighten emotions that involve hope and excitement. But that's just about knowing who your audience is gonna be. So the quality spectrum for song composition is gonna vary. But on the flip side, speaking maybe more to the grind and hardcore bands and fans, if you've been in the game for a long time, let's be honest, have you personally or people you knew, maybe when you were a lot younger, did you ever suspect others are repping for certain bands that weren't even really that good and you figured they, their fans, deep down even realized that too, but you still saw lots of people proudly wear their merch because maybe it was just simply cool to like them for a period of time. I'm sure you get what I'm saying. I'm saying that for some types of bands, the reality, again, if we're being completely honest, is that success doesn't always come from their songs. Maybe they're deficient in that area, so it's made up for by, say, like, having a cool look or some type of reputation that still makes people want to be associated with them, you know? But provided you're in a band that's got some lofty goals, you probably already understand that your songs gotta make the cut. That's a given. But also, you, in the early stages, before even hiring PR, gotta make sure your aesthetic's appealing, too. And today, that's obviously done most effectively through social media. Basic word of mouth in the streets is still there to a degree, but the reality is that social's king. So once you're ready to go, you found a publicist who looks like they're worth their weight and their price, and you link up. You gotta keep feeding them stuff to promote you with, because this is how you ensure you're not limiting their ability to help you. And also very important, unless an agreement's been written up that limits what and when you can promote on your own, say through like simple posts of any sort, you should keep hyping your releases just as much as you did the first day you started out as a band without any kind of outside representation, because again, that's how you're gonna show your publicist you're serious and expect them to stay serious too. Okay, now here's the part where people like me enter. Understand there's gonna be more communication between the influencer and the publicist as opposed to the influencer directly with the band. There's some, but I'll get to that in a minute. But how people like me are most useful is it pays dividends to the bands when the PR person and the influencer have an extremely clear understanding of the expectations for that relationship. Obviously everybody involved only wants good results yielded, but consider the following scenario to see where it can easily go wrong. Say the publicist passes an album to the influencer to review and make a video about. At that early stage, there's happiness. Why? Because the publicist knows they're doing their job. They get a guarantee from the influencer that they're gonna review the client's material. The client is then happy because it says that the publicist is indeed doing their job and thus the cost is justified. However, what if the influencer doesn't like the album? What if they think it's shit? At the stage when the influencer's product has been delivered and if they've shit on the music, naturally that can be catastrophic for the band and potentially secondarily for the influencer too because a few things could happen. One, the most obvious being that the band gets torn apart in the comments section because it's way more likely for a channel's core audience to agree with the influencer than it is for there to be an overwhelming disagreement. And it is that way because most of the time the audience is watching because they trust the opinion of the influencer and they're all around on the same page. So if the review is a negative one, feelings can be heard, people are embarrassed, the music doesn't end up getting a fair shot and being listened to, all that. Secondly though, it can be bad for the influencer because even if they think they made a good video, say for example, they thought they were being funny when they were tearing their album apart and their audience would appreciate that. The fact that it's music that their audience wouldn't like to begin with means it's probably gonna lead to dislikes in the video for which the algorithm will take notice of. Or let's say the click-through rate will be low, thus telling the algorithm that people are passing over it because it's not a band that is relevant to the viewer's interest, so the video is probably gonna do poorly. And then the influencer might blame the publicist for asking them to review something that they thought sucked, but they did it anyway. The band's gonna hate the influencer for shitting all over them. And finally, resentment of the publicist by the band's gonna build for lining them up with a bad source. Now you may ask, well, why would the influencer give it the time of day if they knew their viewers wouldn't bother with it? Because the point I'm trying to make is, small music YouTubers out there, if you're offered a project that you think might get you a lot of views because the band's got some notoriety, whether you end up shitting on it or praising it, you gotta ask yourself, is this gonna be relevant to my particular audience's interest? Because if it's not, you run a very high risk of the video tanking, and early on, that can significantly 
significantly delay how quickly you grow. Not to mention the band scoping it out and seeing low views and thinking, why did we put our faith in this publicist who gave it to a weak influencer? Fuck both of them. And then the obvious question arises on the publicist's behalf. Why should I continue passing stuff to this influencer when all they do is tear it apart? Fortunately, scenarios like this are avoidable with the publicist knowing the influencer's audience very well also and whether it's going to be a good fit for their client. But it works the other way around, too. Yeah, how can the influencer be helpful to the publicist? This is how. When a relationship is forming, what do I mean by forming? How does that work? Two ways. One, the YouTuber may get hit up by the publicist because they've seen him doing reviews on their client's existing material and they'll know they might also be interested in upcoming material. So the influencer will get offered to hear forthcoming stuff ahead of its release in exchange for a review. Or two, oppositely, the YouTuber may decide to find out who the publicist is for a band that they like and they reach out asking if they could be considered to cover upcoming material. So the way the influencer can help create a good, worthwhile relationship right off the bat is by communicating to the publicist what their goals are. Does the influencer only want to serve a certain segment of a subculture? Meaning, for example, do they only want to cover bands regarded as, quote, underground? Do they want to cover a mixture of underground and mainstream bands? Okay, well, what specifically do those underground bands sound like? Are they only death metal, for example? Because the underground, which, yes, I know theoretically doesn't even exist anymore, so just call them special interest bands if you want. But that underground doesn't only house death metal bands. It can house metal adjacent or industrial, experimental, etc. But stuff that some audiences are extremely against. So if it's a case where the influencer approaches the publicist first, or hell, even the other way around, it's always very helpful to describe their intentions up front so expectations are clear and a situation doesn't arise where an album's offered and the influencer already kind of knows their audience is going to hate it, but they feel pressure to cover it anyway because they want to make sure they keep the publicist happy so future projects that they do think would go over well, do still get offered to them. But in the meantime, there's real hesitancy about the current ask. That's not a good thing. So, influencer, if one of your goals is to grow viewership, you gotta know when to turn projects down. Because consider this scenario. If you're being asked to cover something that you got a good feeling ain't gonna sit well with your audience, you're likely to suffer directly, ultimately through demotion of your channel by the algorithm. Even if you're thinking something like, well, even if my audience would never listen to a band like this, I can make what I say entertaining or funny enough so that it's still seen as a good video. The reason that's unlikely to happen is because even if you're a trusted voice, if the band you're covering is one that the viewer thinks sucks, they're probably gonna pass on watching it. Or let's say they've never heard them before, but they start watching you and they decide early on from your description that the band's lame, then they're probably gonna close the video and move on to something else. So that's why if one of your goals is growth, you gotta be true to your core audience early on to make sure that they stick with you. Otherwise, you risk hurting yourself more than helping. So don't be afraid to turn down offers. And at least in my experience, it's not like I've ever been raged at by a publicist for turning one of their requests down. Cause if you're friendly with them, they don't take any offense when you're honest and you say you're a bad fit for what's being offered. And they probably probably respect you more because it tells them that you just don't see any good outcome resulting from it. And they want their client to continue paying them, so yeah, it's worth it for everybody to be on the same page. Hell, trustworthiness like that sometimes creates genuine friendships. What's up, Raquel? Now, while I said earlier that there's more of a relationship between the influencer and the publicist as there is between the band and the influencer, there's does still, albeit to a smaller degree, exist one. And here's an example. Certainly, without the band, the music review and influencer cannot exist. That's clear. But there is somewhat of a dependence for the band, depending on their size, on the influencer, of course. You know, to push their singles or live performance or video, whatever the case. So consider this, bands. Consider if an influencer puts a lot of time into their video. They record it, edit it, they chop it up into vertical snippets to share it on Instagram and TikTok and elsewhere. They do a square photo for Instagram and Facebook. They do a story that contains the square photo, all of which need to be modified and formed individually so it doesn't look like shit on each platform. All of which, take it from me, require a shit ton of time if you want to make your output look good. So bands, thankfully in my case, 95% have done the following. The exception only being maybe some bands that didn't even know about my coverage in the first place. But bands, 
share what the influencer's done for you. Because A, it shows the influencer that you're grateful for their support. And B, hell, it's more promotion for you, right? Because I can promise you, take it to the bank, I can promise you, there are people out there, potential fans that you're trying to reach, that will indeed take you more seriously and consider listening to your music for the first time if they see that people on the ground are pushing you. For better or worse, when you look like you got independently acting foot soldiers behind you, you're taken more seriously. And if you don't, if you don't bother to share the influencer stuff, hell, the next time you release something and your publicist reaches out to people like me to help push it, I, we might be like, nah, fuck those guys. I mean, I personally, that's not me, just because frankly, I'm pretty selfless in most cases, but others might not be. So ultimately, I think the reality is, unless you're friggin' Metallica or Slayer, it probably doesn't benefit you to pass on sharing the influencer stuff that they made for you on your socials. Even if it's just in your story, it doesn't even have to be its own post, but share it in some way. Or if you're too cool to share, at the very least, engage by liking the post or perhaps commenting. And in addition to knowing you're staying in an influencer's good grace by doing that, Here's maybe a bonus. I don't know if some of them want me name and name, so in the event they don't, I won't. But if they're the types of people who feel good about themselves when they know they've made somebody else feel good, I can tell you personally, there have been instances when some of the artists I've covered have reached out directly to express their thankfulness. And man, in a couple of those cases, when some less than happy shit was going on in my life, mother of God, can I not tell you how much those thank yous meant to me and that I will never forget them. Holy fuck. All I'll say for one example is that one of my videos about a month ago that did pretty well reviewing an album, the singer reached out to say thanks. That meant the world to me, man. So what that means to the band is, well, obviously they're awesome, so they're always gonna have people like me remain as fans. I am always gonna have those dudes back in the music world, no matter what, even if they put out a bad album. And yeah, I know I'm only a small timer, but regardless, I will never forget their thank you, and as a result, remain one of their foot soldiers for life, man. Fucking A. So that's pretty much it, honestly. To summarize the major points, bands, if you've got genuine goals, it is very helpful to be clear on what they are and how much of yourself you're willing to give in order to reach them. You already know that. And when you're in a position to hire a publicist to help with your goals, ask yourself if you think you look professional enough yet so the PR person can indeed push a good enough product and thus your investment won't be wasted. Publicist, and this is really the most important aspect of the video that's coming from the mouth of somebody in my position. If you're gonna recruit micro-influencers to help with your client's campaign, make sure you know their audience very well to avoid negative reviews. And influencers also know your audience well because if your goal on YouTube is growth and not just a channel being an art project, which is certainly fine, you really need to try and maximize as many wins early on through views and having a high like to dislike ratio so the algorithm will keep pushing your videos in people's feeds. Which means not being afraid to turn down projects that you know probably won't go over well. But you probably won't even need to have conversations like that in the first place if both parties understand the expectations early and clearly. And that's it. That's stuff I feel pretty strongly about in my short but intense experience so far as a YouTuber bullshitting about heavy metal. I wanted to spew on this because like I said, I really don't think I've seen much about this anywhere out there and I believe my perspective can help foster excellent business relationships between publicists and influencers. And I am done. So if you did like this video, cool man, maybe you can give it a thumbs up. Or if you just like hearing somebody bullshit about heavy metal, then plant your ass firmly on that subscribe button. And we'll see you next time on Concrete Spew. But until then, stay wild, maniacs.